reciprocal. <laughs> Thanks. Fred doesn't believe in evil. He is a saint. So, I'm not going to show you any slides today, unless I need to show a slide, but I probably won't. I'm going to talk to you about a case. And the reason I picked this case is it was a, it was a um, illuminating case for me um, as a, a young faculty member. And um, it ties together a lot of the things we're talking about in psychiatry. So, when I was starting out in the AIDS clinic where I was forced to go um, at gunpoint, uh, Dean remembers this. Nobody wanted to go there because it was everybody who went there kept quitting. And uh, we had several psychiatrists who went to the AIDS clinic who quit. One left and went to Florida. One left and joined the CIA. That's bad, right? <laughs> and um, and uh, the one who left, Fred um, Sheriff, said to me, it's a bottomless pit of despair. I thought, oh, yeah, this sounds like a great assignment. So um, I went to the AIDS clinic, and um, I was trying to get the patients better, working away, um, doing my job. And there was a woman in this clinic named Betsy Greenbaum, who is the world's most bleeding heart social worker. She's the kind of social worker that if a patient shot her, would have said, oh, he must have had a terrible childhood. <clears throat> and she called me up and said, I want you to see this woman. She is the most loathed patient in the AIDS clinic. And um, there's something good about her, but I can't tell you what it is. I'd like you to see her. I was not enthusiastic about seeing this woman. She was 38 years old when I saw her, an African-American woman. And uh, I'll take you through the beginning part, and then we'll talk a little bit about her. So she's 38 years old. Um, she was referred to me because uh, she was in a methadone program. And um, she got into an argument with her uh, methadone counselor about whether or not you can use cocaine when you're on methadone. And in the heat of the argument, she punched her methadone counselor in the nose. Um, she was for the methadone counselor was against. And uh, just in case you didn't know that. And uh, you can imagine the circumstances. And they were going to throw her out of the methadone program. And Betsy was convinced if she got thrown out of the methadone program, she would die. Might have been an accurate assumption. Um, the patient was uh, born and raised in Baltimore. She uh, had a family history of severe uh, dysfunction, uh, lots of drug addiction, foster parents, step parents, step foster parents, sexual and physical abuse in the home, intoxication in the home. So, um, her first uh, physical abuse probably occurred at age six. Her first sexual abuse probably at age nine or ten. Um, she was a difficult student in school. She was told by teachers that she had a lot of smarts but didn't know how to use them, various other things like that. Uh, truant in and out of juvenile detention, uh, preg first pregnancy at age 13, started drinking at 9 or 10, started using IV heroin at age 12 or 13, commensurate with the pregnancy, um, four kids by 19, um, all in foster care when I saw her um, at 38. Um, she, um, she had uh, never had a, uh, a clear diagnosis of a psychiatric disorder. She'd never been married. She had these four children. She'd been in and out of... Uh, so a lot of women end up in jail, but very few women end up in prison. Men end up in prison. Women do not end up in prison. But in studies of women in prison, they are much more psychiatrically ill than men in prison. You have to really screw a woman up to get her to go to prison. Men, it's very easier to get to go there. Um, so uh, she had been in prison as well as jail um, on no, several occasions one in which she lit her neighbor on fire by throwing lighter fluid on her in an argument over some, uh, some trivial thing, but she was really angry. Um, she described uh, her occupational history as never having really worked uh, at the job except for twice in her life. And uh, so when she was about 22 or 23, she suddenly got sober, stopped using drugs, got her GED, ended up getting a nursing uh, assistant uh, ticket, got a job in a nursing home, was working for two years sober, got all four of her kids back and was living independently, and uh, then relapsed to drugs, lost her kids again. And again, at about age 28 or 29, had a similar episode where she got two of her kids back, 
living independently, working in the nursing home, doing great. And she said, she described it later, those periods as having been like the sun came out and it was summer for two years, and then the clouds rolled back in and it's been gray ever since. Um, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, uh, drugs, she had been using drugs since she was an early teenager, mostly heroin, but everything else under the sun. She didn't really like marijuana, but she uses it if she can't get anything else because it does intoxicate her, uh, but mostly um, heroin and cocaine, uh, injecting starting at age 13. Her description of her initial drug use later in the course of her treatment sort of is around um, men who were interested in her sexually giving her drugs so they could misuse her. And that is actually a very common pattern in women in Baltimore. Um, They're introduced to cocaine and heroin because while intoxicated, uh, they'll permit sexual behaviors they wouldn't otherwise. And when they're addicted, they can be manipulated into sexual behaviors they wouldn't permit otherwise. Um, You occasionally see that with young men, too, but it's more common in women. Um, And uh, she had uh, been smoking ever since she was a kid, and when I saw her at age 38, she advanced uh, COPD. Her room air PO2 was about uh, 70. Give you an idea of of how serious that is. At 60, you get flash pulmonary edema, and 60 is considered one of the places where where, where COPD becomes fatal. You you have to give people oxygen because if you drop to 58 or 57, your lung says, gee, we're not getting enough oxygen here, and the blood vessels to that area of the lung clamp down, assuming there's better oxygen somewhere else. The problem is there's no better oxygen anywhere because your PO2 is 59 throughout your lung, and so you get sudden onset pulmonary hypertension and flash pulmonary edema, and you die. And this woman had had a couple episodes of that. She also had had endocarditis enough times to have... Um, to have valvular dysfunction and had some uh, congestive heart failure intermittently. Um, She was overweight, borderline hypertension, borderline diabetic at age 38. Um, She had had uh, one gunshot wound uh, of no real significance, Um, had mild uh, osteoarthritis of her uh, lower extremities. And the other uh, significant feature in her case was that she had uh, HIV infection. But she had 1,100 T cells when I saw her, had been infected for a long time, and actually turns out to be a long-term non-progressor, probably an elite controller. Um, some of you don't know what that means. It doesn't matter. It means her HIV isn't progressing. In fact, um, she, she's never progressed. Um, when I first saw her, she was, uh, I wrote, irritable at least three times in my note, disagreeable, cranky. She gave terse, one-word answers, often not the answers often uh, kind of weird answers to questions. She refused to cooperate with any cognitive examination. And I thought she was mentally retarded because on, on her exam. Um, I treated her, and her, obviously from what I've told you, her intellectual capacities became more obvious as she got better. And she went from being a difficult, irritable, uncooperative, angry, uh, cognitively impaired woman to being a wonderfully articulate Difficult, angry, uncooperative. Uh, uh, that's Dr. Clark's special ring. He knows I'm giving a lecture to you, so he's calling. I- I'm giving a lecture to the medical students. You want to say hi? Say hi to Dr. Clark. I'm, I'm giving a lecture to the medical students. They just said hi to you. That's good. I'll call you back. Uh, okay, call me when you're done. All right, thanks. Bye. <laughs> He's got three of my patients up on his ward, and I imagine at least one of them is torturing him. Um, <laughs> he's not all three. So, um, so uh, psychiatrically, she had been diagnosed with uh, numerous uh, psychiatric uh, problems, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depression, personality disorder, antisocial, histrionic, narcissistic. Uh, she had OCD, ADHD, and probably LMNOP. Um, and then she, did, she had a, a healthy contempt for psychiatrists um, who she had seen in the, uh, in the public, uh, public sector um, of truancy and uh, juvenile detention and then in prisons. Um, so the only medicine that ever helped her at all was amitriptyline, an old uh, antidepressant which helped her sleep. 
she didn't like psychiatric medications very much. Um, when I treated her and she became wonderfully articulate, she was able to tell me the kinds of things I've described to you. So I see her for, uh, for about uh, eight months. She's on a medicine called dizipramine. Um, I'll talk to you about why I gave her dizipramine after a while. Um, and uh, then she went to a funeral in North Carolina and relapsed to heroin while she was there and was lost to follow up with me. And then about two years after that, about when she's 40, I get a call from John Bartlett. I don't, have you guys met John Bartlett yet? So John Bartlett is the uh, guy who discovered infectious diarrhea. He is probably the greatest clinician scientist at Johns Hopkins. He knows everything about everything in medicine. I'm not just talking about infectious disease. I'm talking about cardiology, GI. He knows everything. He doesn't know anything about psychiatry, by the way. He knows everything about the rest of medicine. And uh, one time he said to me, you know, Glenn, the primary literature in medicine is not so vast that someone shouldn't be familiar with all of it. <laughs> I said, I know that, John, but you get up every morning at 3 a.m. and come into work and read until 6, and no normal human does that. So anyway, uh, Bartlett was, her, was on the ward at the time, and he called me up. He said, Glenn, Glenn, your patient is here. Uh, my patient. You'll notice they're your patient. If you ever see them, they're, they're bad. They're always yours. Um, and she'd come in with uh, endocarditis again and uh, was on oxygen and had had a central line place, a kind of a, a catheter called a Hickman catheter. It goes right into your right atrium. Very effective for treating endocarditis because the antibiotics are delivered right to the heart problematic if you inject heroin into it. And um, she had been there for three days, and her fevers had stopped, and she was responding to the antibiotics, and she went down to, quote, unquote, smoke a cigarette. And when she came back, she seemed intoxicated to the house officer and spiked a fever. And they, her tox screen, which had been negative, had turned positive. Um, and they thought maybe she'd shot heroin into her Hickman catheter. I know, not possible, right? And so they talked to her about this, and she demanded to leave AMA, against medical advice. But in a novel approach to health care, she said, this Hickman catheter is in my body, it's mine, and I will not allow you to remove it. I'm taking it with me. <laughs> and John didn't think that was a good idea. <laughs> and the house staff thought, she wants to leave, she's not hallucinated, she's not delusional, she's not psychotic. I have to let her go. Half of them wanted to tie her down and rip the Hickman out and then let her go. And the other half said, we can't do that. It's assault. And she told them she would charge them with assault and call the police if they ripped her Hickman catheter out. And uh, they said, you just have to let her go. So they were calling me for a consult. And uh, I said, I'll come see her tomorrow morning. And uh, about 10 minutes later, the phone rings. I'm in my office up on Meyer 4. Remember when I was in Fire Meyer 4? And it's my patient calling from her hospital bed. She told me to get my fat <laughs> behind up to her room and get her uh, out of Johns Hopkins Hospital. Um, she used a lot of other colorful local phraseology that <laughs> some of you may have heard. Um, and I said, I can't come right now, but I'll send somebody. And I called security and sent them to her room. <laughs> and uh, they stayed there with her for the night, and she was calm and pleasant because there was security here when I call them, they usually send really helpful security guards. There's a guy who is this, roughly the size of the Goodyear blimp uh, on security here, and he's my favorite guy because he, he would say to patients, do what Dr. Treisman says. And they would. <laughs> His hands the size of baseball gloves. One time I was in the ER, and I wanted this patient to sign in, and the guy was just psychotic and would not sign in. I didn't want to commit him. I wanted him to sign in. And he said, he said, give me this slip, Dr. Treisman. He's got, so in, you know, this, this sheet of paper right in his hand, it looks like a postage stamp, and the pencil looks like a toothpick. He goes into the patient and says, Dr. Treisman says to sign in. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> he was a very helpful guy. <laughs> Don't be messing with Dr. Treisman. Okay. I'll be good. Um, it was in the old days when medicine was still fun. So, <coughs> oddly enough, it's still fun for me now. It just causes a lot of trouble for other people. Anyway, so um, 
what would you do? How many of you want to let her go with her Hickman catheter? She's not hallucinated. She's not delusional. She says she's not suicidal. You want to let her go with her Hickman? How many of you want to tie her down and rip her Hickman out? Okay? You're not worried about the assault charge? Okay. How many of you want to um, tell her that she can't leave and she has to stay? Okay? What about her rights and her uh, whatever you want to call it? Autonomy. I violated her autonomy. You probably know this already. Um, what about that? Yep. Yeah, right. If she, if she is intoxicated. And as a matter of fact, when I saw her the next morning, she was no longer intoxicated, but um, still wanted to leave and told me so in a kind of a unpleasant way. Um, what, what else besides intoxication? How many of you want to call a psych consult and hope that psychiatry will take someone with a Hickman catheter at your hospital? By the way, only Hopkins, as far as I know, in the whole planet. Have you ever worked anywhere where they would take a patient with a Hickman catheter on psychiatry besides here? Yeah, well, good. Because <laughs> other places, they say, oh, the patient's too sick, they have a Hickman catheter. You don't take those patients. Anyway, you call a psych consult, that's a good thing. I'm glad some of you would call a psych consult, having that in because back where I was from, People didn't usually call psych counselors. They said psychiatry was useless. But they called me, so that's a good sign. So what would you do? Yes. Speak. Yes, you might be in danger. Absolutely. So the law in Maryland is you have to be dangerous to self or others, have a treatable psychiatric disorder, and there has to be no less restrictive way to take care of you. And there's a few other caveats. Those are essential to the issues. Did you have a treatable psychiatric disorder? So what do you think? So I violated, what I did was, I'll tell you what I did. I went to her room with, I said to the resident, I said, go see her. And the resident said, she won't cooperate with me. I said, go back and say to her, Dr. Treason will come after you've given me the information I need in order to present the case to him. So she was more cooperative. And I went and saw her. And uh, I took the whole team with me, medicine, the whole medicine team and us. We all went in the room. And I said, um, I want to show you these. These are commitment papers. These are certificates from Maryland. And I've signed one. Dr. Bartlett has signed the other. And we think you're crazy. The idea that you want to walk out of here with Hickman Catherine when you shot heroin into it. You can say you didn't shoot heroin into whatever you want to say. I'm not going to listen to you. Your hypoxia was negative. It turned positive. You shot in your Hickman. And the idea we're going to let you walk out of here when you're doing that is crazy. And you're crazy. And uh, so you have two choices. You can come over to psychiatry as an involuntary patient. We'll serve these papers to you, and these nice security guards will bring you over to Meyer 5. We have a bed. And um, on Meyer 5, several good things will happen. You'll be detoxified from heroin. That'll be good. You'll get your endocarditis treated, if necessary, in seclusion, if necessary, in restraints with IV antibiotics. Um, and uh, we'll take care of you that way. And number three, you'll quit smoking because smoking is killing you. And on psychiatry, we don't allow inpatients to smoke. And committed patients, which you will be, aren't allowed to go outside to smoke. And uh, you won't be able to change your status because once we commit you, I'm not going to let you change your status. You'll be an involuntary patient. We'll have a hearing, um, and you might say, well, I'll get released at the hearing. And there's one thing you should know about that. I've never lost a hearing. <laughs> I might lose this one, but I've never lost one. So if I'm the Clarence Darrow of psychiatric hearings. <laughs> And so I wouldn't count on being released at the hearing if I were you, although it could happen. More likely, they'll tell me I could keep you for 180 days, and then by signing a paper, I can give you another 180 days. I probably won't do that. After six weeks, I'll let you go. And then you never have to come here again. But while you're here, you'll get taken care of. Now, the other choice is you can promise Dr. Bartlett and me that you'll behave yourself over here, and I'll come over and visit you every day. And I'll make sure that we give you some of the medicine that helped you the last time, the dizipramine, and we'll give you some methadone and taper you off opiates so you're not in withdrawal. And I'll yell at you personally each day. And if you're very good, you can earn the privilege to go down and smoke. And if you do that and earn the privilege to go down and smoke, we will tox screen you. And as long as your tox screens are negative, you'll be able to keep the privilege. And if they're not, then we'll, you'll have to stay up here. And uh, that'll help you.
So by allowing her to go down and smoke, isn't she at a risk of flight? She's at a risk of flight 10 minutes after I walk out of the room. And that's what John Bartlett asked me that question. John Bartlett, the smartest doctor I've ever met, asked me that question immediately after we left. He said, how do you know she's not going to elope? And I said, she might. But she could have eloped last night. Instead of eloping last night, she called my office and said, please send security to my room so I won't leave AMA. Now, that's not the word she used. <laughs> but she knew me for eight months and is really smart and knew exactly what I would do if she called me and said, get your fat butt up to my room and get me out of here. I would send security. I mean, Dean, what would I do? Absolutely. You don't have to know me very well to know if you call me what I'm going to do. And she did know me very well. So um, the assumption was that at least some part of her was on our side, where she would have just left in the first place. The other issue is, at any point she could leave AMA, this is an opportunity for her to engage in treatment. And if she's not going to engage in treatment, no six-week stay on a psychiatry unit is going to help. What you want to do is give her a choice between less comfortable and more comfortable. And um, given a choice between less comfortable and more comfortable, this kind of patient is going to pick more comfortable, pretty reliably. Okay, so why is it okay to do that? Why can I violate her autonomy with impunity? She asked the right question. Who asked the right question? You asked the right question. Who asked the question about her being intoxicated? Raise your hand. You did. Yeah, so, what, so if she's impaired in her autonomy, I can violate her autonomy because she doesn't really have any autonomy, right? Because she's impaired. Okay, so what's wrong with her? Assuming she's not intoxicated the next morning, which she wasn't, maybe she's in mild withdrawal. What's wrong with her? What's her diagnosis? Huh? Addiction. So does addiction impair your autonomy? And certainly it does. People do things when they're addicted that they would never do if they weren't addicted. So I've already talked to you a little bit about what addiction is. Remember my little cycle of, uh, I can draw on this legally, right? Good. My little cycle of behavior, right? And reward, positive reinforcement, more negative reinforcement, less. Remember this? And then in some people, um, there's this reward internally when you do behaviors like taking heroin and then satiation and uh, then more behavior. Remember, mm, toast. This is the toast section here. So, <clears throat> so she has this thing, and it impairs your autonomy, especially when it's out of control like hers was, right? And the treatment for that we talked about, which is detoxification, rehabilitation. And... Um, We'll talk a little bit about that. What else does she have wrong with her? Is addiction enough? Do most addicts act like this? Most addicts do not demand to leave AMA with their Hickman in, punch people in the nose in their methadone treatment program, and all the other crazy stuff this woman does. What else is wrong with her? Huh? Antisocial, right. So what does that mean? What do we mean when we say antisocial? So um, you already had a little of this, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it to you again, right? Here's a normal curve, uh, height. I'm right there for height. I'm the perfect height because it's average. And five, eight and a half inches tall for a male in the United States is average height. I'm probably now five, and, five eight instead of five, eight and a half because I'm now in the age where you start to shrink a little bit. Um, but... That's average height, and it's the best height for survival over 100,000 years. But it's not the best height for survival at any one time. It's the best height for survival over 100,000 years. So if you dressed for May 24th, or April 24th average temperature over the last 100 years today, you'd be wrong. And you'd be wrong most days. Because the average temperature is seldom the temperature that day. The average environment is seldom the real environment. So in some environments, it's good to be short. Short people out-survive tall people. They need less food, less water. They survive heat and cold better. They need less cotton to make their shirts. They're more green and eco-friendly. So short people have survival advantage. 
in certain environments. Tall people run faster and jump higher. They have survival advantage in other environments. And the environment oscillates, which is why we have this normal distribution. Because these people survive better in some circumstances. These people survive better in other circumstances. And these people, they don't, they, they're not great in any environment, but they're okay in every environment. And this isn't any great thing to be. It's good for survival, but nobody goes up there and says, hey, go out with me, I'm average. Right? Average is not exciting. It's not what makes you special. These are the things, these extremes are the things that make you special. They make you extraordinary in some way. And so I'm going to talk about introversion and extroversion, which you've already heard a little about, right? So introverts, by the way, the guy who did this was a German guy, and uh, he puts introversion over there and extroversion over here. That's Hans Eysenck. And Eysenck says um, extroverts are primitive and don't have much inhibitory action in their brain, like me, and are uh, inadequate in many ways. And uh, introverts are highly Germanic and developed and introverted and, res and very inhibited, and that's better for br that means more better brain development. Now, by the way, Eysenck also said these traits are neutral. But when he writes about them, he's very pejorative about extroverts and, uh, and pretty, uh, pretty laudatory about introverts. So when I went to give a lecture to Mosley where he was, I switched him. And I've left him switched ever since. And it really upset him because he thinks that they should be the other way. Introversion goes over here. I said, well, they're a neutral trait. What's different than they where they go? What's it? Introverts are over here. And so extroverts are here. I said, but they're neutral traits. doesn't make any difference. I think that he, I cost him months of life. <laughs> so introverts, like you guys, are focused on the future. Extroverts are focused on now. Introverts are focused on function. Extroverts are focused on feelings. Introverts are focused on avoiding consequences, like failing. Extroverts are focused on getting rewards. And Madonna and the CEOs of corporations and governors of New York, presidents of the United States. You want to check to a prostitute? So um, these people are at risk for feeling-oriented, now-directed, reward-directed behaviors that get you in trouble because they're not very consequent avoidant. But they can be fabulously successful. They're charismatic, now-focused, get-it-done people. They get elected to office, and they become CEOs of corporations. And if they do well, they are Kennedys and Rockefellers. I take care of some Kennedys, and I want you to know they're extroverted. Um, but if, they go, if it goes wrong, Enron, WorldCom, Held South. You guys probably never heard of Held South, but I want you to know a lot of people's retirement went away in Held South. And um, you, Bernie Madoff, you gave all our retirement to a guy named Madoff, and he made off with it. <laughs> You're joking. You, why did you give all our retirement to it? Didn't you check the guy out? He seemed sincere. These guys can sell ice boxes to Eskimos. These guys are persuasive. They get you to vote for them. Even, even if they're George Bush. You voted for George Bush? My father voted for George Bush. I said, he is, he's had a lobotomy. <laughs> People voted for him. I don't know. I thought he would be a good choice. Why? He lied well. Yes, these guys. Clint, or, um, Dana Carvey said, Clinton could say to you, I am not here, and you'd believe him. <laughs> the most sincere president in the history of mankind. Well, except for that thing with Monica Lewinsky. My father said, what was he thinking? He wasn't thinking. Nobody is sitting in the White House thinking, I wonder how this cigar thing is going to look on CNN, and then does that. That's feelings, baby. Ah, oh, it feels good. Wham! Right? And every extrovert, when they get wham, says, how'd that happen? I jumped out of a plane. I was doing fine. Then all of a sudden, I hit the ground. 
the first 5,000 feet seemed great. Too much focus on now. My patient is one of these people. She is now focused. I want to feel good now. I don't care what happens later. I want to feel good now. I want to shoot heroin in my Hickman catheter now so I'll feel good. But you'll die. But that'll be later. <laughs> Wham! Right? Now, there's a stability instability curve. My patient is not only extroverted, she's unstable. Her feelings come really quickly and go really quickly. And so her feeling pushes come suddenly. And uh, when she gets mad, she gets really mad really fast and punches you in the nose. Next day she says, oh, sorry. I don't feel that way anymore. So when you say antisocial, what you mean is unstable extrovert. We hate these patients. We hate them because they aren't like us. They're aggravating. They're frustrating. This one was the most loathed patient in the clinic because she was prepared to burn the clinic down to get what she wanted. And she was only there to get what she wanted. And it frustrated her health care providers, just like the house staff hated her and wanted to let her go. They wanted to let her go because we wouldn't want to interfere with her autonomy. She didn't have any autonomy. A medical student barely not had done any clinical rotations. No, she doesn't have any autonomy. You weren't going to let her go. Why did they want to let her go? They hated her because she makes people hate her. And there's papers about the hateful patient, and they're about this kind of patient. The difficult patient, there's a bunch of papers on, papers on difficult patients. They're not talking about diagnostically difficult. They're talking about this patient makes me angry, and I hate them. And if you hate your patient, they have personality disorder. It's not you. Because you're here working like crazy to get to be a doctor. If you hate somebody, it's them. But they will try to persuade you it's you. It's your fault. Doctor, he's my last doctor. He was really a good doctor. He knew how to take care of me. He was wonderful. He took great care of me. Well, go back to him. Oh, he quit medicine. <laughs> I bet he took care of you. One of the medical students who I, I like my medical students, and when they work with me, I, I, I have get very connected to him. When she was doing her medicine residency here, was on Osler 8, which is the AIDS floor. She came into my office one time, closed the door, and started crying. She said, there's a patient on my ward, and I find when I'm coming into work in the morning, I hope he died overnight. And I, I feel like I shouldn't feel like that, and maybe I should go into radiology or pathology, something where you don't patient contact, because I, I, nobody should feel like their patient should die. I said, I know that patient. Everybody hopes he dies. <laughs> if you hope somebody dies, it's them! That doesn't mean you're absolved of your responsibility, way by the way, to help them. It means that they're difficult to help because of their style. Now, I want to tell you something. I have a book on AIDS psychiatry, and the first chapter is quotes of great, crazy things patients have said to me. Uh, one, this, is, so the, all, this is the best quote of my career so far. Dr. Treisman, I've been very nervous lately because I've been buying cocaine from a guy who shot me. It kind of doesn't get any better than that, right? <laughs> Let me write that down. That's the greatest crazy things anyone said this month. And in my non-judgmental doctor voice, I said, why do you buy cocaine from a person who shot you? The patient said, well, because he has cocaine. And I said, look, I really like prime rib. You can tell I like prime rib. But if I went to the prime rib restaurant and the maitre d' shot me, I wouldn't go there anymore. And he said, you know, Dr. Reese, with an attitude like that, you could miss out on some really good meat. <laughs> like the guy with what? Pulse. Yeah, I've been shooting cocaine into my pulse vein. That's the carotid artery. It goes right to your brain. And I get really bad headaches on one half of my head. What have you got for headaches? Not, I'm ready for detox because I'm going to have a stroke. Please give me narcotic, so when I have the stroke, I'm not uncomfortable during it. <laughs> These patients say this stuff to you with absolute sincerity. That is their worldview. The worldview of a person who wants to feel a certain way now. 
One of the patients, was when I was just about the time I was taking care of this woman, said to me, you know, Dr. Treisman, you wouldn't make a very good drug addict. Since then, I've heard that over and over again from patients. You wouldn't make a very good drug addict. And they're right. To be a really good drug addict, you have to be here. And I know Dave Edwin says that he doubts it, but I'm really about here. I'm introverted like you guys. I've, I'm pretty good at the extroverted style thing. But I always worry if my patients are going to die and if I did the wrong thing and did I order a creatinine, just the stuff you worry about. Am I going to flunk the test? If you didn't worry about flunking the test, you don't get to be a doctor. There are a few extroverts in medicine, but they don't go into psychiatry. They go into plastic surgery. And, and um, I wouldn't make a very good drug addict. To be a great drug addict, like my patient, you have to be out here. For instance, in West Baltimore, there's a lot of aluminum siding because there used to be a group of people called Tin Men in Baltimore, and they sold aluminum siding. By the way, they were these guys. They sold aluminum siding to all those houses in West Baltimore. And drug addicts have figured out that at night you can go peel that aluminum siding off the sides of houses and sell it for scrap aluminum and get some money. I would have never thought of that. Would you have thought of that? Look, some aluminum. It's just like, it's kind of like mining in a way. Would you have, I mean, really? When they were putting up aluminum poles around Baltimore, we had a rash of patients, of patients, of people stealing cars, tying chains around the poles, and dragging them to scrapyards to sell for scrap aluminum. I wouldn't have thought of that. It's a big problem briefly in Baltimore. Those poles are really expensive. They cost about five, five or six thousand bucks for a pole. Now you get about 200 bucks when you sell them for scrap, but and oddly enough, the scrapyards go ahead and take them. Where did you get this? And I don't ask that question. Oh, look, some aluminum. So um, I wouldn't have thought of those things. I would never make a great drug. I could be a drug. Any of you could get addicted to drugs. I could get addicted to drugs. Don't get it wrong. But I'd never be great. <laughs> you know? I would hang around with a great patient so I could figure out how to be a good drug addict. But I would never be a good drug addict. I'd be an adequate drug addict. I once said to a patient, you're not even committed to being a drug addict. One of my guys, he's, he said, I need a new AIDS medicine, Dr. Treisman, because I'm resistant to the last one. I said, aren't you the guy who threw up in the waiting room because you were in heroin withdrawal? He said, yeah. I said, you're not even compliant with heroin. <laughs> and you're addicted to it. You're not even compliant with a medicine that gives you withdrawal. How are you going to take AIDS? No, no wonder you're resistant. You're not even compliant with a drug you're addicted to. You're not even a decent drug addict. You know, we have a lot of work to do before you can take a new HIV medicine. Right? He laughed. You know, they laugh. They say, yeah, you're right. You know, because what else are they going to say? It's true, you know? You say that, I say that to patients. I say, I say what, what are you talking about? No. Oh, come on. My, my, my guy with the meat. He wanted Valium because he was nervous when he, when he bought cocaine from the guy who shot him. So he thought if he took Valium, he'd be less nervous when he bought the cocaine. It seemed obvious to him how to solve the problem. No! You can't leave AMA with your Hickman catheter. It's crazy. Now, what's, so how do we work with these impossible patients? Well, the key is this. You guys say to patients, if you don't stop doing that, something bad will happen. And to these guys, everything bad you can think of has already happened. But they're exquisitely sensitive to rewards. Exquisitely sensitive. When I say exquisite, I mean exquisite. Modest rewards will get them to do anything you want. And they always come to you wanting something. A form filled out, a prescription for something. And all you have to do is say, I will give you this, but you have to do this thing I want you to do first. I don't want to do that. You don't have to want to do it. You just have to do it. How, how long do I have till 10 or till, till 11 or till 10:30? Huh? 10:30. Oh, I only. Oh, I thought I had an hour and a half. Okay. So I'll, anyway, but they're exquisitely sensitive to rewards. Like my patient is exquisitely sensitive to rewards, and I am a reward. You are a reward. So I said I will come and see you personally. I will give you some methadone. I will do some things that you want, if you do this thing I want. You don't have to like doing the thing. You just have to do it. And by the way, they're used to that. They're used to those bargains. So you just make those bargains with them. 
If they say, well, you do your thing first, then I'll do, I'll do the thing you want. Say, look, see these credit cards? I'm not showing you the numbers. I have these. You don't have these. These mean I pay my bills. I once applied for a credit card for my cat, Shmoo, and he got a credit card. So I have a credit card for my cat in a drawer at home. And I say to my patients, your credit rating is worse than my cat's. My cat can get a credit card and you can't. Do you understand how bad your credit rating has to be to not be able to get a credit card? You can't even get a Sunoco card. I got a Sunoco card when I was like 14, you know. Couldn't buy anything with it, but I had my credit card, first credit card. So um, they don't pay their bills. But if you get them to do it first, then you reward them. You will shape their behavior. And they are powerfully shaped by rewards. They are not shaped by consequences. We are consequence-shaped, and therefore we tend to try to shape our patients with consequences. These patients need to be shaped with rewards. And if you see it purely as a behavioral exercise, instead of getting angry at them, say, if you do this, I'll do this, it's a lot easier to, to get them to do what you want. So second problem, she's an antisocial person or an unstable extrovert. Okay, what else does she have? Addiction, personality disorder. Anything else? Come on. Depression. Who said it? Why don't you just come up here? So what do we mean by depression? In this case, what we mean is the ascending mesolimbic dopaminergic reward circuit that gives you that little, yeah, when you do something good, is off. Now, hers has been off a lot of her life. Why isn't it that she's not, instead of having three months off and three years on, like most people, she's off all the time? Opiates and opiate withdrawal, cocaine will tap those things out. Alcohol will make them worse. Chronic medical problems make them worse. CNS inflammation makes them worse. This woman has had every venereal disease and every bad thing you can have. And she is chronically depressed, except for those two episodes where her interpretation was, I stopped using drugs and everything was great, and then I relapsed. But when you actually talk to her about it, what happened is her mood got better, and she had the energy to stop using drugs. And she did great because she's very smart. She's difficult, but she's smart. And uh, she's not mentally retarded, as I thought she was. And um, she went out and did work and got rewarded by it, and when she got a paycheck, it was reinforcing, and seeing her kids was reinforcing, and everything was good. And she said she relapsed. What happened is she got depressed again. And then she relapsed. Because the, crowd, the clouds rolled in and it was gray. And it's been gray and rainy ever since. Those were her words. But they are chillingly accurate. It is grim when you're depressed. Nothing feels good. The only thing that feels good is being high. And when I gave her dizipramine, I gave it to her. I said, I could give you an inferior antidepressant. But if you want dizipramine, you have to come twice a week and give me negative toxins because dizipramine plus cocaine equals death. And they're, they're absolutely contraindicated. So if you're going to use coke, I have to give you a different antidepressant. But if you'll promise me you won't use coke and you'll come and get toxicrine twice a week, I'll give you dizipramine. It turns out that the... Now, so I've been treating this woman forever. She's 57 now or 56. She's been my patient since she was 38. The only antidepressant that works for her is dizipramine, and she has bad cardiovascular disease, and dizipramine is cardiotoxic. And it's still the only drug that works for her. So she's balanced on this knife edge. She has to have a blood level of dizipramine that's high. She has to take a huge dose because she has a very powerful liver, breaks it down very well, and it's dangerous to treat her with dizipramine. Nonetheless, it's the only thing that worked for her. It just happened to work really well when I gave it to her. And um, she recognizes that. She says, yeah, whenever I go off my dizipramine, Periodically, all the patients go off their medicines just to test you and torture you. Um, when I go off my dizipramine, I, it start, I start to feel like my old self again, like evil. She described herself as evil. Um, she feels like things are hopeless and she's a bad person and nothing good is ever going to happen. So dizipramine, I gave her a therapeutic dose of dizipramine. She slept, food tasted better, life was good, and it was like when she was a nursing aide. Um, and when I gave her dizipramine in the hospital, it helped. So she's got major depression. Nothing feels good. Treat that. She gets better. Is that enough? 
Depression, yep. Oh, yeah, she's diagnosed with which she doesn't have. Schizophrenia is a diagnosis we throw at people we don't like. You know, just like antisocial means I hate this person. Um, so so um, she's so hard to treat, she must be schizophrenic. Now, you wouldn't call her schizophrenic. To have schizophrenia, you have to have first rank symptoms. first rank symptoms. She never had first rank symptoms. But she heard voices. You know how I know? She said she heard voices. Did you ever really hear voices? No. Tell me about what the voices say. They say to harm myself. What do they actually say? They tell me to harm myself. Is it a man's voice or a woman's voice? I'm not really sure. Is it in your head or outside your head? Eh, kind of both. Let me tell you what auditory hallucinations are. Two people, a guy and a girl, Tom and this woman's name Susie, I, don't, I never heard of her, but Tom was a guy I knew in high school, are arguing about whether or not this shirt should be, is blue or not. And they, they say the shirt's turquoise, it's blue, they fight about it, they won't stop fighting. And the guy keeps saying, you're so stupid. And he's stupid too. I said, well, who's stupid? Susie, but also me. That's auditory hallucination. The voices say, take a knife and stab yourself in the chest, in the middle of your chest, because you should die. That's what the voices say. People say that to you. Where's the voices? They're coming from a speaker right there. See it? See that thing? That's the speaker they're using. Okay? Those are auditory hallucinations. This woman had never had an auditory hallucination in her life. Even when she was high, she couldn't describe them to you. Is that enough? Depression, personality disorder, addiction. Yep. Yeah, I just had a question, and kind of goes back to our last lecture too. And you talked how you've never lost a case for uh, in like law and legal purposes. So I feel like throughout this course, there's been a lot of things that I've had preconceived notions for because of the public, the news and stuff, and like now you learn about them. So how receptive is the public when you guys talk in like courts and legal systems, like psychiatry? In medicine, do they believe? Do they we are we are as reliable as senators are. <laughs> the problem is the person talking is usually the wrong person. When I talk, I do really well in court, but I always give my little disclosure first. The people who are paying me in this case are the defense or are the prosecution for my expert testimony. But I see myself as a friend of the court and I won't necessarily say what they want me to say. And I tell them that before they hire me, which is why I don't get hired a lot as a, as a witness. I do get hired, but not very often, because I won't say what they want me to say. It's big money to be a witness. So the people who go to court often are people who will say whatever people pay them to say and put a spin on it so that it looks how they want it to look. Um, and I just won't do that. So it depends on who's talking. The field, as I warned you yesterday, is full of crap. Psychiatry has a lot of crap in it. That's just how it is. So, yeah, when I go talk to pe people about what psychiatry is, I'm very persuasive because I can talk to them about these things. And it, they're easy to understand. Even psychiatrists can understand them. The problem is that people have these religious beliefs in psychiatry they don't want to give up. They don't want to give up the idea that it's always because your mother did it. And that everything is psychological. And that you can treat everything with psychotherapy. You can treat everything with a pill. It's nonsense. But this lady has one other thing that you guys haven't mentioned. She, by the way, came with a diagnosis of PTSD, among other things. What about her life? How does this lady respond to fat, bald, white, bearded authority guys, given her experience? Not very well. So when she met me, her instant response to me was predicated on all of the abusive and misusing and tired and I don't give a shit guys that she met in the course of her experience with her illness. And she was not receptive to help in the AIDS clinic. She had to be there. And after I yelled at her up on, Meyer, up on Hosler 8, she hated me. And she would tell you if she were here right now, if you come to my clinic, you'll meet this woman. She's still my patient. And she'd say, yeah, I hated Dr. Treisman for a long time. He was the, but, you know, he was the first person who ever thought I could be something other than a drug addict. Her life experience is essential to understanding her case. She had this experience, which led to her convictions about the world, which led to her behavior, which led to negative experiences, which led to, and I changed all that. Number one, I changed her behavior by forcing her. 
Number two, I changed her experience by laughing at her nonsense and by saying, I don't care. And number three, when you give patients what they want to get them out of your office, they know you don't think they can get better. If you argue with them, you must think they can get better. You're, they know you're busy. And what she said is, yeah, you took the time to fight with me. I didn't like it, but you were the first doctor who spent all that time fighting with me. So, in the hospital, doing okay, not great, doing okay, gets out of the hospital, comes to clinic. What are you going to do? Well, the first exercise was this. She would come to clinic, and she would walk back to where I was seeing patients and bang on the door with the patient, and interrupt me, and say, I need to be seen now. What are you going to do? Huh? Sorry? Yeah, but how are you going to change her behavior? How are you going to shape her? What I said is, Sheila, I want you to know, I, did, I saw her immediately after I saw you. You wait, and I'll see you. I saw her immediately. I said, look, Sheila, everybody who comes to this clinic has to wait. I only make one exception. If people have a job, even a part-time job, then I see them out of order. I see them when they get here. I see them immediately because they have too many other things going on. What did she do? She got a job. She got a job only so she could jump the line. She got a job as a peer counselor at Hero. Hero is gone, but it was an AIDS organization. And she got a peer counselor. She was a really good peer counselor because she actually was a peer. She had done every bad thing anybody had ever done in the world of AIDS, and she could tell you how to get better from it. And she, was, she, she knew how to manipulate the behavior of extroverts because she was one. She are one. So she's a peer counselor. What's going to happen if she's a peer counselor? What's going to happen? If she had a job, what's going to happen? She's going to come late because of something. Her dog ate her homework. If she comes late, she's going to get confronted, and then what's going to happen? She's going to get fired because she's going to use her, lose her temper. And so she did get fired. And what do you want her to do now when she comes and tells you she's been fired? If your kid got fired, what would you want him to do? Go apologize, right? You want him to go back and apologize, try to get his job back. How am I going to get her to do that? Well, I'll tell you something about Sheila that you need to know. I wrote her case up, and I asked her if it was okay if I wrote her case up, and she said yes, but I don't want to be in a crap journal. I want to either be a New England journal or JAMA. <laughs> Gives you a sense, right? So what I said to her is, Sheila, do you think there's people only I can help and the other doctors here just can't help them? And since she wouldn't see anybody but me, what answer could she give except yes? I said, and you think that people like me have an obligation to see patients that only they can help, even if they're busy and everything? She said, yeah. I said, now, let me ask you a question. Given your history and experience and the kind of person you are, do you think there are people at Hero that maybe only you can help? Well, what answer is she going to give? She's a narcissistic person. Well, yeah. I said, now, you're going to let those people be drug addicts for the rest of their lives so that you can have a fight with your boss. Now we're doing a complicated psychological manipulation. I'm a role model, and I'm modeling behavior for her, but I'm extorting her into saying yes because she wants me to see her, and she wants to identify with me. And so she went back and apologized, and she was so mad at me. For months, she wouldn't see me. She saw Dr. Dr. Hutton's our psychologist, and she saw Dr. Hutton, but she would not talk to me for months. She finally came back. So over the years, I've used a series of these kinds of reward-based behaviors. If she does what I want, I do what she wants. If she doesn't do what I want, I tell her to do what I want, and then I'll do what she wants. And she's doing great. She intermittently works. She doesn't work all the time. She can barely walk because she's got bad osteoarthritis. Her COPD is under pretty good control. She smokes one cigarette a day. Why does she smoke one cigarette a day? To irritate me. <laughs> At one cigarette a day, you could just as easily quit. She comes in reeking of cigarette smoke. She smokes a cigarette right before she sees me. So that I'll yell at her about smoking cigarettes because if I yell at her, it means I care about her. And I haven't figured a behavioral way to get rid of that last cigarette. I got her down to one cigarette. I haven't been able to figure out how to get rid of that last cigarette. It's her way of 
irking me. And she likes it. So, let me tell you what I learned from this case. Number one, you have to formulate the whole case. I was young. I didn't know. You know, it's not just depression. It's not just personality. It's not just addiction. It's not just her life story. It's all four. You have to think about all those things simultaneously when you treat a patient like this. Number two, when you're faced with a case that's absolutely hopeless and you know you can't help them, do your job. Because you will help somebody that you can't believe you can help. And nobody would have believed. If you met this woman now, you'd say, she isn't, it's not possible she was like that. If you met her then, you said, nobody can help her. And everybody said that. Everybody had said that. She was hopeless. And Dean and I have seen cases like that over our careers. And if you do your job, you help a bunch of them. You don't help all of them, but you help a bunch of them. Because miracles happen in medicine. And they won't happen unless you are a therapeutic optimist and do your job. If you say this person's going to die, they will. If you say, if I do this, they might not die, they may have a 5% chance, they may have a 2% chance, but they may live, you will learn something. Even if they die, you'll learn something. The problem is we don't want to be wrong. So we back off and say, look, if, if I do this, I won't know what happens. But if I just make this person DNR and let them go, then they die with dignity and blah, blah, blah. And you're, then you're, you're confident. Be not confident. Have guts. Be a therapeutic optimist and try to get the impossible cases better because that's where you learn the most. I learned a lot from this patient. She's still my patient. And I tell her, I thank her. I say, you know, I learned a lot from taking care of you over the years. If you hadn't been here, I don't think I'd be nearly as good a doctor. You have challenged me at every turn. She laughs. She says, yes. And I, when I presented her case years ago at a, at a, this was when she was a peer counselor, I presented her at a Ryan White conference, and she was in the audience. And I went to her and said, do you mind if I present your case? A woman in the audience said, I can't believe you violated her autonomy like that and made her stay in the hospital. And she shot up out of her chair and said, you think he should have just let me die? <laughs> I thought she was going to kill this woman. <laughs> if you let the patient die and see their sister, their mother, their, their brother, if you let them go with their Hickman catheter in, how are you going to explain that? Don't do anything where you can't explain it to the family. Where if you were seeing someone's mother, you couldn't say, this is why I did it, and I was doing my best. If the administration says you can't, you have to let this person go, you have to do this, think, how will, when I'm, the administrator won't be there saying, I told him to let her go. You'll be there. Think about what's right for your patient all the time. Formulate them, understand what's going on, and then think about what the right thing to do is. And you'll be fine. But you'll be challenged. You need help? Ask somebody. There's a million people around here who are really good. When you're out in private practice, even if you go work in the mountains, you can call somebody. If you're up against it, get advice. Don't give up. Anyway, thanks so much. Hope that was fun. It was a blast to be your teacher, and I'll see you on the wards, and I hope this was fun for you. It's always fun for me to talk about these cases with you guys. Hope you enjoyed psychiatry.